Donc, euh, pour les gens en arrière, si vous êtes intéressés, il y a encore beaucoup de place en avant, au milieu, soyez pas gênés. Il y a de la place pour être à l'aise pour un autre 45 minutes. Ça va nous faire plaisir de vous avoir avec nous. Prochain sujet de conférence. <coughs> Projet de gestation des truands en groupe. Tout ce qu'il faut savoir. Donc, les premières fermes ayant fait la transition vers la gestation... La gestion des truands en groupe ont déjà quelques années de recul. <coughs> il, est, il est essentiel de se servir de leur expérience <coughs> pour améliorer et optimiser les futures installations. Les aspects de l'aménagement du bâtiment, des équipements et de la conduite d'élevage seront abordés lors de cette conférence. On veut tout d'abord aussi remercier le commanditaire de cette conférence, la, fer, la, la ferme, bien, la ferme mais F. Ménard. Euh, le conférencier qui a accepté de venir nous entretenir, M. Sébastien Trucotte. Sébastien a fait ses études en agronomie à l'Université Laval. Aujourd'hui, il cumule plus de 13 ans de service dans le secteur porcin. Il œuvre au sein du CDPQ depuis plus de six ans et agit à titre de responsable du secteur bâtiment et régie d'élevage. Il possède une expertise de gestion des truies en groupe, d'aménagement de bâtiments et de quai de chargement et de mise en application des normes de bien-être. De la ventilation et la régie d'élevage fait aussi partie de ces critères à travailler. Ces tâches englobent la préparation de demandes de financement, la supervision de la réalisation des projets, <coughs> la rédaction de rapports et d'articles de vulgarisation. Il travaille régulièrement à, cons à conseiller directement des éleveurs par divers services qui sont offerts au CDPQ. Donc, je t'invite à venir nous présenter le fruit de tes résultats, Sébastien. À toi l'honneur. Tout d'abord, merci Yvan pour cette belle introduction. Je voudrais remercier aussi le comité organisateur d'avoir pensé à moi pour venir vous parler des trucs en groupe. C'est un honneur pour moi d'être ici aujourd'hui. Bon, parfait. Donc, comme vous le savez, les nouvelles exigences sociétales font en sorte que les truies euh, devront être logées en groupe d'ici 2022 pour tous ceux qui envoient leur part chez euh, Olimel ou Alimasta, ou d'ici 2024 pour tous les autres producteurs, car c'est une, une exigence euh, du nouveau Code du Canada. Vous savez probablement, probablement aussi que le parc de bâtiments porcins est vieillissant au Québec. Euh, en effet, la moyenne d'âge euh, des bâtiments porcins est de 24 ans au Québec. Euh, on a plus de 60 de nos bâtiments qui ont plus de 20 ans. Donc, de ce fait-là que les gens sont obligés de mettre leurs truies en groupe, euh, puis que les bâtiments sont vieillissants, il y a déjà environ 25 des truies du Québec euh, qui sont logées en groupe. 25 mais à peu près, on, on pense qu'il y a moins de 10 des bâtiments, par contre, où est-ce qu'ils ont déjà fait de la transition. Donc, il en reste encore beaucoup à faire. Donc, aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler de comment on fait son choix pour, euh, au niveau du système d'alimentation pour gérer les trous en groupe. Je vais vous parler de certains critères d'aménagement qui sont très, très importants euh, avec euh, les trous en groupe. Je vais vous parler de régie d'élevage, comment bien, bien planifier son projet. Puis aussi, euh, je vais vous donner certains conseils de producteurs qui ont déjà fait euh, la transition. Donc, comment on choisit son système d'alimentation? Euh, le choix du système va souvent être basé sur le type d'éleveur ou le type de main d'œuvre. Donc, si vous êtes, plus, si vous êtes à l'aise avec la technologie, Bien, certains systèmes vont être un peu plus euh, dédiés pour vous. Puis, à, à l'inverse, si la technologie vous fait peur, si euh, vous êtes plus euh, un peu conservateur ou que vous voulez de l'équipement qui qu'on sait qu'il va toujours fonctionner, bien, dans, ces éleveurs-là vont peut-être être, être euh, plus axés vers d'autres systèmes. Le choix va aussi dépendre euh, du niveau de contrôle qui va être désiré sur l'alimentation. Est-ce que c'est important pour moi de contrôler ce que chacune des truies qui sont en groupe vont, vont, vont manger? ou si contrôler l'alimentation d'un parc, euh, pour vous, c'est suffisant. Euh, le choix du système va aussi dépendre du coût. Comment ça va coûter faire la transition, comment ça va coûter les équipements. Euh, mais il faut, faut aussi penser qu'il y a un coût, oui, de la transition, mais aussi, il y a aussi un coût de fonctionnement. Une fois que la transition est faite, comment ça va me coûter 
euh, au niveau de l'entretien de l'équipement, comment ça va me coûter au niveau de l'alimentation, est-ce que ça va me coûter plus cher de mouler parce que j'utilise tel type de système. Donc, c'est toutes des questions qu'il faut se poser euh, avant de faire un choix. Euh, comme vous savez, il y a plusieurs systèmes. Euh, il, y a, il y a cinq systèmes euh, d'alimentation pour détruire un groupe. On peut les classer en deux catégories. Euh, il y a des systèmes où est-ce qu'il y a de la compétition euh, pour l'aliment, donc système de bas-flanc et puis d'alimentation au sol. Euh, système où est-ce qu'il n'y a pas de compétition pour l'aliment. Euh, oups. Pardon. Euh, système de réfectoire autobloquant. Euh, par contre, dans ce système-là, c'est une alimentation homogène pour toutes les truies. Euh, puis il y a deux autres systèmes où est-ce qu'on peut contrôler l'alimentation de chacune des truies. Donc, euh, système de DAC et puis de DAC autobloquant. Donc, il n'y a pas de système parfait. Euh, chaque système a ses avantages et ses inconvénients. <coughs> au niveau des systèmes où est-ce qu'il y a de la compétition pour l'aliment, pour pour donc alimentation au sol ou système de bas flanc. Comment ça fonctionne dans ce système-là? Toutes les truies vont manger en même temps. La moulée est distribuée soit directement. Pour les stalls There are pros and cons, so in that case, we don't have any uh, control on what the sows will eat. The advantage of these systems is that they are simple, low cost, and we can reuse a lot of uh, existing buildings and equipment. It's also easier to convert existing buildings. Uh, now, for the downsides, there is no control over what the sows eat. And often we've noticed that the feeding cost is normally higher in such systems because you have to give more food for each sow. Now, for things to work well with these systems, obviously the producer has to be a good observer. You know, he has to be present during meals to detect problematic sows. And during meals, all of the sows eat at the same time. So that's when you'll see if there's a sow that's setting itself apart. Well, this sow probably has an issue, so you have to act quickly. Maybe that sow is being attacked by the others, or the dominant sow doesn't let her eat, or it's wounded, or something like that. So you have to act quickly. And which system is also important to be very meticulous when you form groups in the same group. You know, you have to have the same parity, same flesh condition, same size. Now, for self locking free access stalls, this currently looks like the, uh, most of the uh, gestation uh, stalls. Now the sows can go in and out of the stalls as they want and there's a common living space between the two rows of stalls. In such systems, feed theft is impossible, that's one advantage. But the other advantage is when you'll form groups of sows, the first time you'll form the group, the sows can go hide, they can go uh, take shelter in the stall. So normally there's less bickering, less infighting amongst the sows. Shut system. Now for the downsides, you need a large building area, which represent, uh, represents a bigger investment. Often, you know, the buildings will be 10 to 15 percent larger than with other feeding systems. It's also hard to adapt to existing buildings. If a producer already has conventional system, you want to use this system, you'll have to go into major renovations you know, break all the concrete to install such a system. This system works very well for all types of producers. You know, if you have a good results in, in stalls, you'll have good results with this. Now for the ESFs and the self-locking ESFs, for the operation of these systems, each one of the sows is identified with an RFID. And to eat, the sow needs to go into the ESF the sow will walk in, be identified by the machine, then the computer will set out the food according to the parameters that the producer will have entered into the computer. Now, the difference between the ESFs and the self-locking ESFs in, the, in, in a large ESF, normally you can feed 60 sows, another machine can uh, supply up to 80 sows at the same time. Now for the mechanism, for the opening and the closing of the locking system, it's automatically. It's done with pneumatic systems. So the sow goes into one door and goes out through another door. And the system also gives water. Water is given at the same time as the feed. Now in the self-locking ESFs, the self-locking ESF can deal with 20 sow. The sow walks into one door, and when it's finished eating, it has to back up. So it has to come out of the same door. In the mechanism, it's the mechanism that 
will open and close the doors by itself. So the system is a lot more simple compared to the conventional ESFs. And in these systems, there's no water that is given compared to the uh, standard ESF. So the advantage of both systems is you're certain to give the right quantity of feed to the right sow at the right moment. And we've also noticed uh, that you don't need as much feed as for systems that it, where you have competition. This savings is between 15 and 80 kilograms less of feed per sow per year compared to floor feeding or shoulder stall feeding. These systems offer many possibilities, so we can mark sows, we can brand them, you can detect heat, you can give precision feeding, you can manage uh, the feeding of sows remotely, and also the ESF system allows us to grade animals. You know, when you have dynamic groups, for example, in my park I might have uh, sows from various uh, groups that are at different uh, stages in their gestation, so we'll say, well, th this one will go into the farrowing section, so when the sow goes in to eat, then the machine will send the outgoing sow into a different direction. Now the downsides, well obviously they have higher technology, they're more complex. It's also more costly than other systems. Well, it depends what you compare them to, of course. And you need a certain amount of animal training. You know, the animals have to learn how do these systems work. For ESF systems, a certain training must be given to make sure that 100% of the sows know how to use it. You'll need seven to 10 days approximately. And for the self-locking ESFs, it's quicker, three to five days. And normally 100% uh, of the animals have understood how to use it. Now, for success, you need producers who are comfortable with technology and mechanics, who are uh, handymen. And for the training, you need people who are animal lovers, patient, because sometimes it can take a while before a guilt or sows understand the principle. And you also have to be very observant. In such systems, the sows don't all eat at the same time. They can eat one after the other. So if you want to detect what's going on in the pen, you have to make them stand up. You have to look at whether they're healthy, or if there's any lameness or something like that. Now, one of the most important pen layout criteria it's important that in all systems, whether it's uh, shoulder stalls or ESF or self-logging ESFs or whatever, the feeding system, the layout of the pen is extremely important. A bad layout will lead to confusion among sows, which normally leads to an increase in aggressive behavior. That's when we'll see uh, vulva biting, we'll see in more frequent and larger intensity of fights. And what happens when the layout is not optimal it means more sows will be taken out of the pen. I've even seen uh, reductions of performance sometimes because of this. So to give a good layout to the pen, you have to understand the sow's behavior. Given the choice, the sows rather lie down on a solid floor compared to a lattice floor. The sow prefers to lean on a full wall compared to a wall with holes. And you'll notice fairly rare to see a sow that's lying down in the middle of anything. Normally they'll look for corners or you want to lean on a wall or something. Sows will look for drafts in the summer and try to avoid them in the winter time. Normally sows will relieve themselves close to the water sources. So you have to use this behavior to our advantage when you lay out the pens. And as you know, sows are hierarchical animals. They use aggression to establish dominance. So when you're thinking about layout of the pen, you need to give the possibility of sows to be able to avoid fights and run away. If you're going to remember only one thing from a conference today is this, the 10-foot rule. It's easy to remember. The 10-foot rule, it works almost everywhere. For the past the corridors, when you have corridors where you want the sows to circulate, it's very important to have a minimum of 10 feet. Why? Because if a sow uh, lies down uh, crosswise, well, the sows can still walk around. I'll show you an example here. Here, the opening is less than 10 feet and the sows went and lied down there. So this sow, if it wants to go drink, you know, the water's over here. Well, she can't go. She has to get into a fight. So this harms the flow of sows throughout the pen. The 10-foot rule also needs to be resected between a water source and or a wall 
and an entrance or an exit of an ESF or a self-locking ESF. You also have to respect the 10 feet between the back of a shoulder stall and a pen division. In this example here, it's a shoulder stall and the sows are eating, the feed has been distributed to the floor, well, inside the shoulder stalls. So in between here, and well, just to compare, I have six feet here. So the sows can't back out and see where there's room to go eat. So the sows run into each other. They try to find where the available room is, but they can't see it. So this leads to a lot of unnecessary fighting amongst the group. Now for the lounging area. As I said, with the behavior of sows, we know they'd rather lie down on a f solid floor and on a solid walls. So it was studied in Europe. The ideal place to lie down is 10 foot wide with a depth of six to seven feet. And look at the way sows will lie down. So at any point of time, a sow can get up and leave to go drink or eat, whatever. Now, if you give more than 10 feet, to the sleeping area, well, we'll see that it'll be more random distribution. Same thing if the laying areas are more rectangular. This is about 15 by 20. So the sows lie down in any which way in such laying areas. With the, they're always dominant sows and dominated sows. So here, the dominated sows, oh, the arrows are not correct. The dominated sows, if, if they're lying down here at the back, so the, the, nominated, the dominated sow, the inferior sow, does not want to bother the other sow. So they can wait 24 hours before eating or drinking because they don't want to bother other sows. So if you have such a laying area, well, the sow that is inferior in the hierarchy will still be able to go eat. Now for the floors. I'm often asked the question, is it better to have slats or solid floor? I would say what's most important is to have dry floors. So choose the right slats when you make renovations or new constructions. Whoop, my animation didn't come, it is, doesn't work, sorry. But anyway, there were various types of slats. The first slats that were marketed here in Quebec, they have very small openings, so we're two foot wide, there's only two uh, holes. You have to know that as the openings become less frequent, in theory, it's more comfortable for the sow because you get closer to a solid floor. But the downside is when the sows uh, have dejections, it stays on the floor. So this slat manufacturer increases the size of the slats, increases the number of the, of the holes. So then when the sows have dejections, it stays drier. You also have to be careful of the state of the slatted floor. Sometimes they're worn out like this. When it's worn out like this with the sows running around in the pen to go eat and, and drink, you'll have uh, problems with the uh, feet. Also the spacing between the slats. We'll try to avoid large holes like this because the sows can have their hoofs stuck in here and you'll have problems with lameness and so on. What's also important, if you change slats, put new ones, suppose you redo floors into concrete. Concrete, it's a very uh, basic concrete and it will come and soften the hoofs of the animals. So you have to neutralize the concrete. How do you do it? With an acid. So you apply acid directly on the concrete. And once it's neutralized, well, the concrete will remain neutral. Now, concerning water, water must be located where we want the sows to relieve themselves. So you have to position the watering section above the slatted parts in the traffic areas and close to the feeding areas. Currently, we don't have any recommendations concerning the actual watering system. There is an ongoing project at the CDPQ, so we should have results next fall. So we're comparing six types of water supply systems, bold uh, nipples and so on. Now for ventilation, the drafts have to be at the right place according to the season. So in the summer, we want to send the drafts in the laying areas, and in the winter time, you want to send the drafts in the passageways or the dunging area to make sure that the sows relieve themselves there. Now, pass-through gates or manholes it allows the employee to go into or go out of the pen without having to jump over a door or open the pen division. It's essential with group sow housing if you want to walk through 
sows and see what's going on. It's a lot easier with such pass-through gates. Now for hospital pens for problematic sows, these hospital pens must be as close as possible to the group sow pens to, you know, if a sow has lameness and you make her walk 100 feet to go in through a hospital pen, that's bad. You want it to be close. So if this pen can be as close as possible and even as possible, if it's part of the rest of the group of sows, this is what's recommended. Now the space that is recommended depends on the feeding system. If it's floor feeding or the shoulder stall feeding system, it's 10 to 15 percent of the space for the problem sows. So if I have 100 sows in my group, well, I need 5 to 10 places for my problematic sows. That, you know, either they'll be too skinny or they have problems with their legs. Now, for the ESFs or self-logging ESFs, it's 3 to 5 percent additional space for my problematic sows. Now, for livestock management, it's possible to get excellent performances with all housing systems. This data comes from France. I, won't, I would have liked to have data from Quebec, but we don't have enough experience. We don't have the, uh, this data. So if we compare shoulder stalls and self locking uh, sorry, ESFs, why isn't there any uh, floor feeding? Well, the system is not very popular in France. And the self-locking stalls, sorry, the self-locking ESFs were not yet available at that time when the, this study was done. So if we look at productivity, it's very similar according to the three systems. So around 29 wean piglets per sow per year for fertility is very similar. It varies between 80.5 and 89.7. So there's no statistical difference. And for the culling rate, very similar. Um, and in 2011, the F IFIP compared the group uh, housing systems versus the old ones, and the performance were similar. There was no difference. And they also compared in 2011 for the uh, culling cages versus group housing, and the culling rates were similar. But the causes for culling were not the same. Often with the groups housed sows, there are a bit more culling for uh, leg problems or lameness. Now for the required floor space per animal. The code of practice recommends certain areas. They'll vary according to the type of group, whether it's gilds, sows, or gilds and sows in the same par pen, and according to the type of floor. What you have to know is that the less you have control on the feeding, the more space you need per animal. Now, the minimum recommendations according to the systems. This is based on various studies made by large uh, pig uh, producers in the U.S., those who have done a transition. So what is recommended is that for the floor feeding systems, the minimum, I remember, it's a, these are minimums, 22 square feet per sow and 18 to 20 square feet per guild. For the shoulder style system, the minimum recommendation is 20 square feet per sow and 16 to 18 square feet per guild. And for the shoulder stalls, the surface inside the shoulder stall must not be included in a 20 square feet. And the recommendation for ESFs and self-logging ESFs is 19 and 15 for the sows and guilds. Now the fight management. Unfortunately, group sow housing means that there will be fights. What are these fights for? It's to establish the hierarchy. And normally, this fighting lasts less than 24 hours. You have to know that the first time you'll put sows together, you know, from a uh, herd that has just been in, in stalls before, the fighting will last longer. Sometimes it will last for weeks. Why? Because the sows who've never been housed in a group, they've never learned how to socialize. So for them, they don't know how to intervene with, or they don't know how to interact with other sows, so they think that aggression is the best solution. They haven't learned how to run away. So there are some tips to reduce some fights. Well, even if somebody uh, uses all these tips, you'll still have some fighting, but you won't have so much. The intensity also will go down. So amongst these tips, 
You can put cells of the same group side by side in the servicing pen. This is fairly easy to do. You could put the same cells from all gestations together, so always have the same cells that come together. So every time you'll put this uh, group back together and give an extra meal in the servicing pen before forming groups. So cells that have a full stomach often will probably feel like lying down compared to fighting. Additional meal before they arrive, especially with the uh, shoulder stalls or floor feeding system, you make them eat when they're servicing pen, and when you send them to the group, you give them another meal. So the sows, instead of thinking about fighting, well, they will probably feel like lying down. Now, once the groups are formed, you can close the room lights. You can also use products that mask the sows' smell. I would say it works more or less. Some producers think that it works well, some say it doesn't work. Have well designed pens with escape zones. So, if you have a well designed pen, it's very large and there are panels in certain places. Well, the sows can run away, can go hide from the sow that's attacking them. And it's important to respect the recommended surface areas for each system. Well, sometimes you design a pen for 60 sow, but you put 65,000. Well, you're not respecting the square footage. And to enrich the living spaces, well, when you form groups, you won't have much impact, but enrichment of the living space of sows is important. Once some sows will go and play with those objects, it could be suspended chains, it could be, you know, a balloon at the end of a chain, a piece of wood. You'll see those who use such an enrichment of the uh, stalls or the pens, the sows like them. Instead of going to aggress another sow, they'll go play with one of these objects. Now, concerning the size of the ideal group, I'm asked this question quite often. How many sows should I put in my pen? Well, I say it depends on many things. It depends on the system. It depends on the size of your facility, of uh, how you manage the, the livestock. What you have to notice, as the group becomes smaller, the hierarchy becomes stronger. As you can see here on the picture, if in such a small park I have a sow who's very, very dominant, well, it can decide that the other sows will not eat. But if the sow I put it in a park of 50 or 60, well, this super dominant sow cannot dominate all the other sows. You have to know that starting at 40, 50 sows, they don't recognize each other as well, the sows. So instead of fighting once against the other, well, they run away because they don't know if the sow, they've had a fight with uh, that sow, yes or no. So you have to use this when you'll decide the group sizes. Also, as the group becomes bigger, if you go to the other extremes, you have 100, 120 sows per group. If you look for one sow there, it can be long to find it. So the ideal size of the group will also depend on the size of the herd, the size of the band. So if we look at uh, floor feeding, as an example, at a minimum, you need two groups to be able, well, since you don't control what each one of the sows will eat, you have to be able to, at the minimum, put the smallest sows, the gilts, and the P2s together, and the bigger ones together to give them a chance against the competition. And what is recommended is in a group size between 10 and 25 sows. Why not below 10, as I explained earlier on? If the park is too small, the dominant sow can have huge control on all the other sows. And why not more than 25? Well, at some point in time, it becomes hard to have a homogenous group of sows. Now, for the shoulder stalls, same thing. Ideally, two uh, minimum two groups per band, and bands of 10 to 30, uh, sort of the group size. Now, for the self-locking ESFs, recommendation is to have parks of 40 or 60 sows. Why? Earlier on, as I said, a self-locking ESF can feed 20 sows. I also said that starting from 30 to 40 sows, the sows don't uh, recognize each other as easily. So what we recommend is to have, say, 40 sows to have two machines. So if one breaks down, the sow can still go eat in the other one. And for the layout, you can have various zones, one for eating, one for laying. You know, it's easier for the layout, sorry. And for the ESF, what we recommend is to track what the manufacturer recommends. So if it's a machine for 60 sows, well, it's probably better to have 60 sows. And if it's a machine for 80, well, to be as close to 80 as possible. Now, when you work with a group sows, the work is very different. Often you need to walk amongst the animals to see what's going on, to see if there's lameness and to look at the body condition. You need to be more observant. 
than when they're in uh, stalls. So what is recommended to have kind of your kit for these rounds? You know, paint markers, some will have antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. So the fact that a sow has a leg problem, they'll be able to treat them right away. A notepad to note which sow will have been treated or observed. Don't forget that the sows move around. So if you see a sow that has a problem with her leg, if you don't identify it, it's, you'll probably have to look around to find it next time around. Now there are many tools to help with group sow housing. For the ultrasound, there are uh, instruments that allow you to stay standing up and to do the ultrasound, whether for sows that are lying down or standing up. For vaccination, many will prefer to work with what is called a slap shot here on the picture. Don't forget that sows walk around, they're not in a cage. So sometimes it could be easier either for vaccinations or other treatments. Now for getting the sows out of the pens, either it's a two-person job or some producers use something called a long arm. So long arm is kind of like a, a piece of fabric on a roll. It allows you to isolate the sow that you need to use. It works very well. I've tried it. You also have to know that for ultrasound vaccinations, it's faster in stalls for 9% of the pen's animals. But the last 10% can make you dizzy. Sometimes you'll have to run around a lot to be able to do or perform whatever action you want to do. Now I want to talk about the importance of good planning when you're building or renovating for group sow housing. You have to think about the future of the farm and which direction you want to take it. You mustn't be afraid of involving all the staff and the next generation of workers because they're the ones who will be working with this whole system. Don't be afraid of questioning everything. You know, do you want to increase or decrease the number of sows? Do you want to change your livestock management practices, go to two weeks, four weeks, whatever? Can I use another section of the building for group sow housing? You also have to think about the other work that needs to be done, medium term, long term. So should I do renovations in the firing section? Should I modify my ventilation and so on? So when you have a rough idea of what you want to do, as a project, I give it. I tell you to often. It's a good idea to start the administrative steps right away. If you have to increase the number of sows, you have to go get your authorizations from the environment department. Then you have to validate with the municipality if there are any regulations that you know prevent you from increasing the area. Sometimes you can't even make a building bigger if you don't increase your number of sows. If you enlarge a building, you have to check. Are you still respecting the necessary distances the, with the neighbors? Ask for all your permits with the municipality. You know, fill out whatever formulas to obtain financial aid from the MAP Act that was announced recently. As I said, these administrative steps can take a year or even more, especially with the environment, since there are many projects that are currently ongoing, whether in the, the hog sector or in the dairy sector. Often, this will take 10 to 12 months just to get the paperwork done. Now. When you have a clear idea of what you want, then you have to make choices. You have to choose a system, and if the system, there's more than one vendor which can supply that system, well, you have to choose which vendor. You also have to choose a contractor. Don't forget that agricultural contractors are already overbooked. They work in dairy and poultry and, and hogs. So to summarize, the project you have in mind now, it could really take up to two years before you could implement it, so it's important to plan correctly. Now I'll talk about the transition type that we see more and more often. People build a new farrowing uh, barn and then they renovate, well, they transform the current farrowing section with a, into a gestation section. Why do they do this? Well, often their farrowing section is obsolete. They want to put bigger cages, six by eight, to try to improve their performance. They'll also install equipment like uh, feeding systems to maximize eating often a question I often get what am I going to do with the herd I currently have while I'm doing all this renovation work well it depends on the project if the project involves the building of a new building or an expanding the size of an existing building you start by building a new section then you use that space to take the sows from the current herd you send it to the new section so this clears up space to do the renovation in the existing building now for a farrow to finish farmer if there's no 
expansion. Well, you can put some sows into the finishing part to do work in the gestation part. For some, you can rent a building. You have to be careful, you know, uh, sometimes a new site with biosecurity is not ideal, but it could be a solution to rent a building. But I've also seen a temporary reduction in inventory. So we could reduce for all groups or one group, uh, one person call the whole batch and just purchase pregnant gilts. And if you're stuck with certain diseases, it might be an advantage to just do a depopulation, repopulation cycle. I also wanted to talk about uh, advice from producers who've done the transition already. You have to remember that during renovations, it's all about compromises. You know, compromise between the cost of transition, how much it's going to cost, and the optimal layout. Sometimes, when as you're looking for the optimal layout, it increases the price. Many producers try to keep existing floors without breaking too much concrete. It's possible to do so. It depends on the system. It depends on the floors you have. Now, the cost of breaking concrete varies between eight and eleven fifty per square foot. This includes, well, actual breaking of the concrete, redoing new floor, or for the either solid floor or slatted floor. Sometimes it's better to do things right at a higher cost than to live with a bad decision for the next 20, 25 years. I want to show you an example here. I'll need Alex to cue video, Alex. So here it's a solid floor. And you can see the uh, sows moving around in the circulation area. As you can see, there are some sows that are going to ha hurt their uh, feet and end up with lameness. And there are a number of solutions, ideally on that farm. They ought to have broken the concrete. And in that zone, it should be with slats because it's a circulating area. However, one could do things with the existing floors. The fact that you add some uh, enrichment for it could be a chain or sometimes what works best is chains because they they like to play with the chains there's always a sow that's playing with the chain you'll notice that when it's a circulation area there's always a sow playing with it uh, so they won't lie down there even if they prefer to lie down on a solid floor if you add an object like that to enrich it no sows will come and lie down here because they'll always be bothered if they do. You'll notice also that when a sow plays with enrichment objects, sometimes they don't relieve themselves in that location, so the floor tends to become dry there. If it's not a circulation area, you can add panels, as you see here. So you can see that by adding a panel, the sows will go and lie down around it. And sometimes you can encourage the sows to relieve themselves in certain areas. You, you can add nipples, suspended nipples such as these, and it's almost for sure that they'll relieve themselves in that area. Of course, it wastes a bit of water, but by having a wet floor here, then the sows will relieve themselves in that area. Regarding uh, slats modification in gestation, when renovating, often the lats are in good condition in the gestation area, but they have openings like here. So in order to block those, the, it's for manure. Uh, so they've been using it for five or six years, and then they use long metal plates like this to block them. I think you can go up to 20 feet long and install them with stainless steel rivets rather than using T-bolts like this. Why? For two reasons. T-bolts, and then <coughs> the end of it sticks out, which can harm the sows in the pen. And the other reason is that sows, as you know, it's an object. It's like an enrichment object. They'll play with it, and then they'll loosen them. And when they loosen them, then they can actually remove those metal bars. So is it worth putting bars like this? The cost of a slat of two feet by seven feet long is about $45. So sometimes you have to look at the
pros and the cons and decide if it's worth recycling those slats for five or six thousand dollars that it'll cost you always have to as i said earlier when renovating it's always a question of making a compromise so i'm going to go through uh, one after another some tips from producers regarding anchor pen dividers ideally you want to have them anchored at two places from uh, floor to ceiling and when you do this type of anchoring you want to make sure that they're solid and that the trowels will not be able to break them if it's not possible and you just have a pole that is as high as the pa plastic panels then use u-bolts instead of t-bolts they're mu uh, much more difficult to install but they're much more solid and concerning combining gilts and sows it is possible to do it it can work but it's preferable to house the gilts with the same size sows with systems such as ESF or self-locking ESF the sows have to be familiar with how the operation of the feeding system before putting them in with the sows with lameness sometimes people say that with group housing there's more lameness than in uh, cages it's true but or it stalls rather but if you walk around look at the sows and sometimes you see a sow standing on only three feet but don't worry because right now that lameness doesn't have any impact the sow has to stand up and eat and then lie down again but the same sow if you put her in a group then she has to walk around the pen in order to get the food and water so that lameness you'll see it right away and uh, it's like they say it has much more impact this lameness so breeders observe it more often when they're in groups and this is a tip from a producer that I see here in the room you have to be more demanding on limb quality when purchasing new gilt you have to if you want to make the transition in six months plan ahead and be more demanding on the quality of the limbs of the gilts you have to consider that the transition can have some problems the sows that have worked in the stalls have to get used to being in groups and the personnel have to learn the new system this adaptation can take up to a year and I can tell you it can take a year and there are certain sows that have only known stall housing that do not adapt to group management 10 or 15 percent of the sows regardless of what system you have to reform you have to call them because they won't operate in a group either because they don't understand how the new system works or because they'll be too aggressive toward the other sows or because and they may have a problem where they have the hooves are like a ski kind of they so you have to you know d increase the color rate so you mustn't underestimate the amount of time needed when doing the transition for training employees as I said for learning the new systems and also if you go to a, a, a self-locking ESF training the animals for the first time is quite something a hundred percent of the animals have to learn how the new system operates and once the herd is operating you only train the gilts but you have to train a hundred percent of the sows and all at the same time because often the renovation is ready all at the same time so that's one thing you mustn't underestimate the amount of time needed to do that in conclusion the best system the best group sow system is the one with which the producer feels comfortable group management of gestating sows is possible but we must adapt we have to build on past experience both from Quebec and in Europe and especially most first and foremost projects must be well planned don't hesitate to contact CDPQ if you have any uh, renovation projects or other questions about group managed sows and we provide transition support for group house sows so if you have any questions you can get in contact with me at CDPQ so thank you and I don't know if there are any questions I imagine so before we give the floor to the room I want to say Sebastian there have been a couple of conferences where I see group house sows 
And I can tell you it's a mine of information in this one. It's really amazing. Plenty of things that you were able to bring out when you meet with a producer alone, but you, because you've seen a number of them, this gives us a huge mine of information. So uh, satisfying the concrete to make it less dangerous for the, the hoofs than the 10-foot rule. These are things I learned about today. It's fantastic. So I understand that you really uh, lapped up the information. So are there any questions on that? No questions? Maybe I have a little one. Well, do you want to go ahead, Thierry? We'll take a question or two, and then after that, go ahead, Thierry. Yes, I was wondering if you evaluated. You know, you mentioned you have to be comfortable with the system, of course, but which system is the most profitable? Taking everything into account, the feed and everything. Unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I don't want to sell one system any more than another, but of course there are certain systems in which Yes, it'll be less expensive when you do the transition, but on the other hand, for the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to cost more for the feed. But I can't really tell you, I did not do that analysis. You have to understand, Thierry, it's a little bit like the dairy producers. They have a carousel with a, a, a robot, and I think that they have. we have the same challenge. The producer has to be comfortable with it and be able to get the service that comes with it, too. But I can understand that you had a good question regarding finance. Remy, the last question. Yes, well, I would just like to know, concerning a group SAO housing, is it based on the number of days or on the percentage? There's one producer who talked to me about that. that he, he was doing it. He put 75% of his SAOs in a group, and it went down to 50%. I'm not sure I understand the question. Actually, what you have to respect is the number of days that the sows will be in stalls. That's what's in the code of practice. Actually, you can keep the sows in a stall up until 35 days after weaning, and then you have to put them in a group. That's in the legislation. What about the dominant ones? Do you leave them with the group, or do you bring them back into a stall? I would say it depends on the system. If you're in a system of EAS or self-locking EAS, ESF, sorry, when there's no competition f or competition for access to the food or the machine. Once the sow is inside, you know that the, uh, she will eat her ration. So the dominant sow can be allowed w to be with the others. If the systems have more competition for the food on the ground or shoulder stall, then it's on a case-by-case -case basis. If it's the first time around, and the dominant sow attacks everyone, you'll pull her out. But what is done generally, if you have 15 or 20 sows, if you have a dominant sow and she's not too dominant or is okay, then you just take out the the thin one. Because if you take out the dominant one, they'll, they'll fight to get a new dominant one. So if you bring out the dominant sow, another one will take her place within the group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. So, Sebastian is going to be with us. So, during the cocktail and in the hallway, I'm sure he'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. And even I personally will take an appointment with the CDBQ myself. So, I would like to, I might just add something. I'm going to the CDBQ booth. If you want to come see me, I'll be there. Excellent. So, I would ask you to, Martin, one of the members of the conference committee, to hand you over a gift to thank you for your participation. Thank you, Sebastian. That closes the animal welfare workshop. I just want to mention, friends, that the presentations you saw here this afternoon and in the other workshops will be available in a video format over the coming weeks on the website of the Park Show in the conference section. And we will see you back here in 10 minutes the time it'll take us to get the wall open for the door prize draw and the last presentation that we'll have all together, 10 minutes from now.